today we are going to be talking about an episode called Keeping Up with the Georgians. And this was filmed back in uh, September 2007, series 15, episode 7. And this is where the team visit Hunt Street, which is near the city of Bath in Somerset. Um, and they were excavating a grand mansion. And today I'm joined by Professor Elaine Chalice, who is head of the history department at the University of Liverpool. And Professor Chalice was actually on that excavation. So uh, welcome, Elaine. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, and I think one of the things that we're going to be talking a lot, obviously, uh, the programme is called Keeping Up with the Georgians. Um, who are the Georgians? It's a good question. Uh, it's a category term basically the historians use to describe uh, the uh, Hanoverian rulers of England. So it goes from George the first, 1714, right up to the end of George the fourth's reign and, and William's the fourth's reign. So it basically did the coronation of Victoria. So 1837 when she, when she takes the throne. And this was actually during the Age of Enlightenment, wasn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? This is a really interesting period. The 18th century sees um, lots of scientific um, endeavor going on. It's an age of improvement. It's an age of, of empire. It's an age of new commodities and consumerism. It sees the rise of the novel. Um, it, it's a fascinating period. Parliamentary, our parliamentary democracy in England gets much more formulated in this period. We um, have lose the American uh, colonies, we gain in, in colonies in India. It's a really interesting period of, of sort of uh, development and just endeavor. Yeah, and you've got people like uh, Isaac Newton, um, Caroline Herschel, uh, the famous astronomer, Jane Austen, the famous novelist, um, who actually lived near Bath, well, she lived in Bath, um, didn't she? And uh, the mansion that we're excavating uh, was very close to that city. Yeah, that's right. Um, Jane Austen was there a slight, little bit later than, than what we're talking about in the uh, particular program. But yes, during very much during that time period. And the, the mansion itself was close enough to Bath that you could easily take uh, a day trip out. And people did come out and do day trips. We've got records of people coming out and doing sketches um, of, of the house and, and the, the water, um, the, the, the lake and all of that. So it's the kind of thing that you, you might do for, for an afternoon with a picnic. Let's talk a little bit about the um, the history of um, the house. So it was it was um, so we've got the, the the family the Poppins. Can we talk a little bit about those? Sure. The Poppins are are a dynasty in decline actually by the 18th century. They'd made their money from a basically a sharp witted uh, Elizabethan lawyer um, uh, under the Queen Elizabeth's reign who'd made money, um, and then through the 17th century they go back and forth between. Um, the Parliament, uh, Cromwell's people, and and the uh, Royalists. As soon as uh, Charles II comes back to the throne, um, in the 18th century, they they cast their lot very firmly in with the Hanoverians. So they support the Hanoverians and and the Georgian monarchs uh, and the what we call the Whigs, the Whig political um, uh, picture. Um, and we've got. The house itself being built by start is started by Francis Popham's father in about 1755, and then Francis himself takes over the house. He doesn't marry Dorothy, his wife, until 1772, so it's already been going for a while. And then they are only married for seven years. He dies in 1779, but she carries on working on the house until her death in 1797. So it's got a long run that this house has been being being built on. So it, it, we know that something had to be going on. I think um, actually in the um, program you actually talk about the will of Dorothy Popham and she sounds like a really interesting lady. Can you tell us a bit more about her? Yeah, she's fascinating. Um, she she's um, By the time that she marries uh, uh, Francis Popham, she's already been married. She's a widow. And so uh, when he dies, she's widowed for the second time. She understands the legal system quite clearly. And what's interesting is she's absolutely determined she's going to make sure that this dynasty stays on. So she writes her into her will that um, the people who are going to inherit from her, first of all, it's her, her husband's illegitimate son. And then if he does dies without either getting married or only having daughters and whatnot, it goes to her husband's nephew 
nephew, but either of them have to take the name Popham as a surname. And if they don't, within six months of the will, they lose everything. And she also makes sure she uses the legal means at her control to say they can only be tenants of the estate. They can't actually sell it. They can only use the profits from the rents um, for themselves, but they can't actually, as what we call alienate, in other words, sell the property. So she's really putting her foot down, isn't she? I mean, she, she's she's been widowed, but she's not kind of retired to the attic, has she? She's she's carrying on. She sounds like quite a formidable character. Yeah, she's she definitely has not not retired to any attic. No, no, she's she's an elite woman. Um, she uh, is the daughter of uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, you know, she probably grew up largely in London. Um, she, her sister lives in London. She has she has a house in London. She has another house in Alnwick. She she goes back and forth by the looks of things to London for the season. You know, she's quite a formidable woman. She, we don't know how much time she would have actually spent in Hun Street, but probably the summers is would be the, the likelihood, um, but not necessarily all year round. And um, why is that then? It's very much the, the, the way that uh, the elite operated. In the country houses were often usually, uh, often lived in only in, in the summer up until the early autumn. And then you might um, go off to one of the, the spas like Bath, for instance, for a few months to enjoy the culture and the music and maybe take the waters and do a bit of flirting and whatnot like that. Um, and then you'd go into London for the parliamentary season and you'd be in London for the parliamentary season until sort of after Easter. And then you might go off visiting or to another spa and then back to your country house. So there's a whole cycle to the year. So that's really interesting in that you've got the, the idea of people, um, families traveling backwards and forwards between different houses and between different cities. They're traveling along the roads. And I think you say that there's actually documentary evidence of um, the Pophams actually being held up by highwaymen at one point. Yeah, there, there is. I can't remember right now if it's if it's Dorothy and her sister or it's just her sister. But yes, there is. They, they were held up by highwaymen and there's a record of that. And this was one of the, the dangers of travel in the 18th century. You could be held up by highwaymen. I'm talking about Dorothy Popham. Um, I mean, is she a fairly typical character of the, the, the period? That's it. That's a good question. Yes, I would say in many ways she is quite a, a typical character of, of the period. There were lots of quite formidable women who went on to, you know, effectively live their own lives. There are lots who who struggled under under you know patriarchy and all kinds of misogyny as well. But if being a widow of and specifically a widow of independent means, you know, having enough money to to do more or less what you wanted to, uh, was probably as good as you were going to get. And there were quite a few elite women um, who would have uh, fulfilled the same kind of thing as, as Dorothy Popham did. You know, having a house in the country, having somewhere in town that they either rented or leased or owned, going back and forth, visiting people. You know, they, they were in control of their own money usually. Um, they could do pretty much what they wanted. So, you know, being a widow, if you were a widow that was wealthy, was a good thing. And there was a lot of science happening around this time, wasn't there? Um, and um, all kinds of wonderful things happening in the world of botany, chemistry, astronomy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Georgian women were involved in that? Well, some women were involved quite heavily in these kinds of things. Of course, we've got Ken Herschel, so that, who's just in Bath, just up, up the road, effectively, from Hunt Street, and then um, off towards Reading, because they move, they move uh, after a period. When, and she's involved in uh, what we would say now is straightforward astronomical observation and of, uh, astronomical discoveries. Um, but we also have women who are botanists. Uh, we have women who are uh, translators of classical texts, we have novelists, um, you know, there are, there are kinds of things that women could do. It's a small group of women still, but it is a growing group of women who come usually from the, the upper middling or the elite ranks of society, who have opportunities to develop in different ways. But of course, it wouldn't have always been um, that easy for women as well, if you were on the, on the kind of the other end of the scale, what would that have been like? Well, being at the bottom of the scale wasn't much fun. Um, if you were going to be a, a servant, and, and the vast majority of um, of 
working people in, in society and working women would have been involved in various kinds of work, whether it was uh, service, domestic service, working on, on farms, working in, in uh, low level manufacture, uh, in retail. It could be really hard, really um, wearing work. Um, and if you were old and poor and on your own, it was really tough. And the overseer of the poor's records around the country can show you lots and lots of, of old poor women. It's, it's actually very sad, isn't it? I think it does make you very thankful to be living in this day and age. It's it was it was a much harder world, of course, in lots of ways. And and you also had um, a much um, you know you, you knew much less about uh, health, and so consequently health was precarious always and, and the, the poorer you were and the poorer the housing conditions were, the more likely you were to have bad health as well. So um, I know that you've studied all sorts of documents and, and all kinds of archives, you know, and it um, must be really fascinating. Um, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about why history is so important. Why should we study it? Is it just loads of dusty documents? <laughs> oh, I wish, no, it's definitely, history is wonderful. Um, if we want to understand where we are now, and the society we live in, and the kinds of stereotypes, the kinds of, of trends in thought, the kinds of developments, we need to understand where we have come from. And history gives us that. And when we're looking at the past, we're looking at a whole range of things. So dry, dusty documents, well, some of them are fascinating. You know, they're, they're letters, and there's, there's um, maps, and there's all kinds of printed works. But we also have things like clothing, uh, material culture, the commodities, even, you know, you know, the selling of sugar, the selling of tea, you know, the, the, the way that the empire was brought home to people. Um, we have all kinds of objects. And of course, with archaeology, we have the, the material structures as well that we're trying to uncover. And all of that together gives us an incredibly rich picture of what life was like, and how things might have been similar or perhaps very, very different. Thanks, Elaine, that's really fascinating. Um, one of the things that I'd like to ask you is why is it so interesting to watch this episode? I think this was a really good episode to do and it was an interesting one because it's a mystery. Um, we didn't know whether the house had been lived in. Uh, we didn't know why it had been torn down and what the problem was with the house. And I think you'll find out not every answer, but most of them. Thanks, Elaine. I think you're right. It really is a mystery, isn't it, actually? And I think it's definitely worth watching um, to see how all the documentary evidence comes together, all the, the, uh, the pictures, the illustrations, Stuart with his maps, uh, and actually looking at the architectural elements, the finds. It's really interesting. And so watch this, to see how that mystery of the Jordan mention is solved or not. can't do any of this work without you so please subscribe back us on patreon and make sure that time team comes back again